Okay, we're back to it. Revelation 15 is where we will be. We will cover the entire chapter today. Um, as we turn to the next section in Revelation, let me take a couple of minutes to reorient everything we have learned so far in our study. Since I've been off for a couple of months um, and we haven't been in Revelation, it's easy for us to kind of forget some of the important things that we've discussed over the last several years, almost a year and a half, two years, um, so that we can get our compass reoriented and aligned with where we are going for, how we're going to move forward, where we're going to go as we journey through Revelation. Now, as I think about the perspective uh, that I've come to believe um, is the proper way to view Revelation, it's through debating, it's through looking at all the different views, uh, that cyclical recapitulation view, right? These are the two main arguments between the, the body of Christ. You were to understand the, the book of Revelation chronologically linearly or uh, from a cyclical recapitulation view. Um, when I think about the two views, and we, we've put forward throughout the study that the cyclical recapitulation view um, is clearly the accurate way to interpret and understand the book of Revelation. We, we saw how the judgment day has been referenced and symbolized multiple times throughout the study, um, showing us the cyclical recapitulation view, right? One text that as I thought through that, the cyclical recapitulation view that, that came to mind is Ecclesiastes 1.9, right? It's a great passage to help us line up our compass again because it teaches us a core fundamental truth of how this world works. That Ecclesiastes 1.9 says, what has been is what will be and what has been done is what will be done and there is nothing new under the sun. Any keen observer of history can see the truth of this passage throughout history. The truth in the statement, history is, redoomed, is doomed to repeat itself. It seems like the events of the world are on repeat. It seems like it's over and over and over again. Throughout the generations, there is a cyclical recapitulation uh, with how the events of history seem to line up, especially when you talk about a God pouring out judgment on people. Okay, and as we go through this, uh, I'll give you some more examples. So this concept of history is doomed to repeat itself. Um, this idea that what has been done will be done and there is nothing new under the sun. This concept is the foundation of the cyclical recapitulation view. It's, an over, it's on repeat, over and over. Different people, different nations, different people groups, but it's the same thing from a spiritual perspective. You pull back the curtain of the physical, you see the same operations behind it in the spiritual. So it's, this concept is the foundation of the cyclical recapitulation perspective, which again, I've put forward in front of you for a year and a half now as the proper way to understand this book. So let's recap so far what we've seen in Revelation. In chapters 1 through 3, we saw as the gospel is proclaimed and the Holy Spirit applies it to the hearts of the redeemed, they become lights or lampstands in this dark world. Remember the images that we saw in, in Revelation 1 through 3, the lampstands. As lights, we are blessed with the reality and the assurance that Christ is with us in our presence, because you remember the image, the vision of Christ being amongst the lampstands. So we're blessed with the assurance that he's with us and he is in our presence no matter the circumstances that, that we're in. In chapters 4 through 7, we saw that as lights in this dark world, the redeemed are subjected to many trials and afflictions, including persecution, and for some, even martyrdom. Okay, this is all coming from chapters 4 through 7. As sufferers for Christ, uh, we are blessed with the reality and the assurance that like the Israelites... In the Old Testament, the redeemed are currently in the wilderness wandering through this age and will one day enter the eternal promised land. So that physical reality of the exodus and then the wilderness and then into the promised land, which happened to the Israelites in reality in the flesh, in the physical, was all put forward to eventually point forward to and give us a better understanding of what we're going through as the people of God through this world, right? The Israelites were saved out of slavery from Egypt, but they didn't go right into the promised land immediately. They wandered, for them it was 40 years, and then they entered the promised land. Same thing with us from a spiritual perspective. We are rescued from the slavery of sin and death upon our salvation and conversion. But we don't, upon being converted, go right into our eternal promised land in heaven, right? No. 
were wandering through this age, through this wilderness of this age, of this time, and eventually we will enter into our eternal promised land. So we saw those images and those pictures and those truths put forward in chapters 4 through 7. Chapters 8 through 11, we saw that judgment falls on those who persecute the redeemed throughout this age. Over and over again, throughout this age, throughout this time, these judgments are either redemptive or judicial in purpose. For some, these judgments bring them to repentance, thus showing that the judgment was redemptive in nature. For others, these judgments fail to move men to repentance and prove to be judicial in purpose. We saw this picture and this reality, these truths, in chapters 8 through 11. Chapters 12 through 14 helped us to pull back the curtain of the physical and showed us what lies behind this conflict between the redeemed and those who persecute them is a deeper conflict, a more fundamental warfare between Christ, the seed of the woman, and Satan, the dragon. So as we see the reality of the persecution of the believers, we see that when we pull back the curtain of the physical, we see the Behind that, it was actually causing these things to, to take place in the physical was the warfare between the seed of the woman, Christ, and the dragon, the serpent, Satan. So we saw that reality in chapters 12 through 14. So the question that arises is what happens when the judgment God pours out on unredeemed people proved to be judicial in purpose and yet is still met with stiff-necked, hard-hearted unrepentance. Does God permit such stiff-necked, hard-hearted unrepentance to go unpunished until the final judgment day? Do we think God's wrath is only going to be poured out on judgment day? No. When we saw Deuteronomy 28, we saw the reality of this. God's wrath being poured out on the disobedience of Israel and the reality of what happened to them. So we don't think that if God's warning, trumpet warning-like judgments, or seals and trumpet warning-like judgment, if they're judicial and they're met with stiff neck unrepentance, that God still just holds that judgment back until judgment day only. But he does pour that out throughout time on people. On the unredeemed. So that's what chapter 15 and 16 show us, that throughout history, when the wicked fail to repent in response to the initial manifestation of God's judgment, which are trumpet-like warnings to repent. Trumpets are warnings to turn and repent. Judgment is coming. If it's met with that stiff-necked unrepentance, a more horrifying and final last judgment comes. If it's met, that the trumpet-like warnings are met with unrepentance. Chapter 15 and 16 shows us, when the wicked ignore the warnings of trumpet-like judgments and continue in their wickedness, God takes his hands off and gives stiff-necked, hard-hearted, unrepentant, wicked, prideful sinners over to a depraved mind and over to his wrath-filled, bull-like judgment. So the debate among the body of Christ is when does he do this? When does the bulls or when does this wrath come? Some say it's only coming at the end. Some say it comes throughout the age. Some say it's only coming in eternity in hell. But chapters 15 and 16 are bringing forward these realities. So in these verses, what we're going to see in chapter uh, 15 through, we'll come back to the text, in chapters 15 uh, verses 1 through 8, we're going to see first in verse 1, the introduction to the seven bowls of God's wrath, verse 1. Uh, we're going to see the ch an image of the church triumphant in heaven, verses 2 through 4. And we're going to see the inevitability of God's wrath in verses 5 through 8. If I was to boil this passage down to a main point, um, I would say that the main idea here that this vision is given to John to then provide to the churches is to provide us hope. When I say us, I mean initially the original readers of Revelation and then through the church throughout the time. is to provide hope to persecuted believers by giving them a picture of themselves in eternity, praising the Lord Jesus, as well as to provide assurance 
that God's wrath will one day fall on those who persecute them. And it will be a wrath that is final for that particular persecutor. Okay? So let's go back and read Revelation 15, verses 1 through 8 is where we're at. Revelation 15, verses 1 through 8. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing. Seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. And also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this, I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chest. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels we're finished. All right, let's look again. What we're going to do, we're going to look at verse 1, see the introduction to the seven bowls of God's wrath, 2 through 4, we're going to see the church triumphant in heaven and the inevitability of God's wrath in 5 through 8. So let's look at verse 1 again and see the introduction to the seven bowls of wrath. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. This verse is the source of significant disagreement amongst the body of Christ with regards to how to understand the book of Revelation. Here it is. This is like the battleground between the dispensational futurist and the idealist, if you will, cyclical recapitulation. What is meant by last and finished? Those are the words that the disagreement amongst the body of Christ um, is centered on. What does he mean by last and finished? Some believe that the divine judgments of these bulls pertain only, key word, only to the end of history right before his second coming. This would be the dispensational futurist view who holds the chronologically linear view to the entire book of Revelation. They're saying that last and finished means last meaning very end of time only. The bulls are only at the very end of time, which I can definitely understand why one would think this, because last means you know, end of time. It can, it can mean end of time. But we've already seen how the chronologically linear view of reading Revelation is not accurate. We've already established that. It's very clear. Because we have seen the judgment day being referred to multiple times in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, sorry. Sixth seal, for example, no question refers to that last day, game over day. Stars falling, mountains crumbling, it's over. Some believe, so you got this, the, the dispensational futurist who say last and finished is only talking about the very, very end. That's how they see the word last there. Some believe that last simply means that the bulls are the last of the sevenfold visions John saw. So the seals being the first set of seven, the trumpets being the next set of seven, and the bulls being the last, finishing the three sets of seven. Since the sevenfold visions are finished after this, this also makes sense. I can understand why people think this as well. Other believers um, believe that when you consider that the trumpet judgments function as warnings, because in the Old Testament, trumpets were warnings, right? The judgment was coming. If you consider that trumpet judgments function as warnings, 
they affect end that they only affected a third of the earth, the sea, the rivers, the sun, and the unredeemed mankind. Because if, if you go back and look at the trumpets, you see it's a third of, a third of, a third of. Some would say. Uh, the bulls, however, are considered last because it is impacting all of the earth, all of the sea, all of the rivers, all of the sun, and all of unredeemed mankind. Therefore, uh, there is an intensifying reality between the trumpets and the bull, and it's completing also the set three sets of seven. All three of these. Yeah, makes sense. They all absolutely make sense. And that's why I would say that it's not either or of these. It is both and of all of them because what the bulls, the trumpets, and the seals are doing is they're giving us a picture of how God is interacting with this wicked world during this age with regards to his judgment, which includes all of that, as well as at the very, very end. So I would put forward, it's not an either or between these groups, it's a both and. That these bulls are functioning as this finished and last for particular people throughout age. I mean, think about Nero, for example, and the judgment that fell on him as he persecuted Christians, killed them and put them on stakes in his garden and lit them on fire to light his garden. That judicial seal, trumpet judgments, were poured out on him throughout his life. God warning, calling to repentance, and it was initially and eventually met with stiff-necked, wicked unrepentance. Nero refused to turn and repent of his wickedness. And eventually... The bulls of wrath were poured out on him, which then manifested in him um, being condemned to die by his governing body. They would turn their back on him, and he would eventually commit suicide. Same thing with Hitler. Hitler, the wickedness that he engaged in throughout his life, right? Seals, trumpets, warnings of repentance, turn from this wickedness. Adolf, turn, met with unrepentant, wicked, um, stiff-necked, Unrepentance would eventually be met with God pouring out wrath, judgment on him that would be his last and he would be finished. And he, uh, when the soldiers were coming to conquer and and, uh, take him uh, down, he would also turn and commit suicide. So last, it's all of it. It's how God interacts. The same thing with Deuteronomy 28, like we read a couple weeks ago. There's, there was a call to repent, 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 Israel, repent, repent, repent. They refused. That call to repent was met with stiff-necked disobedience. What would happen? Judgment would come in the form of the Babylonians. And what would then take, be a result? Deuteronomy 28, right? The, the horror of being taken into captivity and, have, and having famine so bad that you have to turn to cannibalism. These are all examples of the process by which God brings judgment on the unredeemed. That's what we're seeing here. So I, I would say that it's, it's all, it's, it's all. Yes, it's talking about the very end because the very end is part of this entire age. It's not just the very end. And it's not just for Nero or Domitian during this early church age. It's just how God interacts with this world in the realm of his wrath and his judgment. So the Apostle John is going to tell us about the seven bowls of wrath. But before he does this, his next vision is a flash forward to a time after Christ's second coming and gives us a picture of heaven, just like the flash forwards we saw in chapter 7 and chapter 14, where we saw the 144,000 singing praises to the Lamb on the throne. It was a flash forward. Why is this important? Well, remember, he's writing this to the persecuted believers during the early church who are being killed for their faith in Christ. And these visions, and then the book of Revelations, uh, book of Revelation, not Revelations, there's no S at the end of Revelation, by the way, just want to make sure. This was giving them hope, right? It's to provide hope and assurance to be faithful unto death, that as uh, you're being persecuted and killed for your faith, be faithful. 
And so one way to encourage them, to give them hope, to be faithful to, in the face of persecution is to give John, who then writes in the Revelation, a picture of what their life is going to be like in heaven. And that's what we see here. We saw it in chapter 7. We see it in chapter 14 with 144,000. That's what we're seeing again here in chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Notice the problem with the nations here in verse 4. Who will not fear. That's the problem. People don't fear him. Read Deuteronomy 28 again. That will help to create a proper fear in your heart towards the Lord. That's the problem with the nations, with people. We don't fear him. Out of that fear will come a humility and a reverence for him, which would bring him glory to his name. All right, so the redeemed are referred to here as those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, which we have just saw earlier, just a couple of uh, verses, chapters ago um, in uh, Revelation here. They're being referred to as they are the specific people who have conquered the beast and the image and the number of its name. The song they are singing is the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Well, what does this mean? What is this song? Where is it coming from? What's the purpose of this being here in this, in this chapter? The vision is connecting us back to the drowning of Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea, which happened in Exodus 14. Picture this. God's people were slaves in Egypt under Pharaoh. God brought them out of that and through the Red Sea and are now on the other side of the Red Sea. The victorious people of God are seen singing a song of victory back in Exodus 15. I encourage you to read it. We won't do that this morning. So there's a song being sung of victory. They had just been rescued out of the slavery of Pharaoh, brought through the Red Sea, now on the other side, and they're singing praises to God. So the People of God's victory over the Egyptians here in Exodus was a foreshadowing. I mentioned this earlier before you guys came in. It's a foreshadowing of us. Because what's happening in this vision? The people of God are singing praises, the song of Moses. That brings us back to Exodus 15. That's the song that's being sung. Um, and what I'm saying to you is this whole out of slavery, I'm going to say it again. Being the Israelites being rescued out of the slavery of Egypt, bring, being brought through the Red Sea, then they wander in the wilderness, and then they enter the eternal promised land. That's what we're experiencing from a spiritual standpoint. We have been rescued out of the slavery of sin, just like the Egyptians were rescued out of the slavery of Egypt. We as people of God, the redeemed, whether you're a Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. It matters whether or not you've been redeemed, born again, saved by Christ. We have been rescued out of the sin of slavery and death. Uh, we have been brought through uh, the turmoils, the chaos. We're currently being brought through the wilderness of this age, right? We're Because when we're saved, we don't go immediately to heaven our eternal promised land, but we're in this wilderness wandering, this age, this time of our lives. We're waiting to enter the eternal promised land. Just like the Israelites, they entered the, the, the promised land. We will eventually enter our eternal promised land. So this is bringing, this song is bringing the reader of Revelation back to Exodus, back to uh, eat the, the being rescued, back to coming through the Red Sea, and the singing the song of praise to God. That's what the song is doing. It's the song of Moses, which is in Exodus 15. But it's also known as the song of the lamb. So what's the point? Why is it the song of the lamb? 
Well, how does the people of God gain victory over the dragon? It's through the lamb. Amen? All right. Which is why John sees the church triumphant singing, um, the, why it's called the Song of Moses, connects us to Exodus 15, and the Song of the Lamb, because in both cases, in our own salvation through the wilderness of this age into our eternal promised land, that was the Lord who delivered us. And it was the Lord Jesus who delivered the Israelites also out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, through the wilderness, into the eternal promised land. So it's, they're overlapping the song. Well, wait a minute, John. You're telling me that Jesus was the one who brought the Israelites out of Egypt, but he wasn't born until a few thousand years later. Jude 5 says this. He says, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, it was the Lord who did that. Remember, the Lord has always existed. He took on flesh. He has always, right there you see the truth of him existing before he was born and took on flesh. It was Jesus that brought them out of the land of Egypt. It was Jesus that brought you out of the land of sin and death. And he's leading us through the wilderness, and we will eventually enter into the eternal promised land. That's incredible. I never saw that in Jude until I studied this. I'm like, huh, that's right there. Jesus brought him out of Egypt. He used Moses, but Jesus did it. Wait a minute, he wasn't born until a few thousand years. It's because he's existed. You see his deity right there. The one who always was. So that's what's happening here in this vision. This vision is helping us and communicating to us that uh, making connections to the Old Testament, the Exodus, that that's what we're doing. That's what we're in the midst of. We believers, the redeemed right now, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 500 years ago, 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now if he hasn't returned, we, those, we, the redeemed, are walking and wandering through this wilderness and will eventually enter the eternal promised land. All right, let's move to uh, the inevitability of God's wrath is what we see in verses 5 through 8. After this, after what? After he sees this vision. He saw the vision of the redeemed standing on the glass mingled with fire. Um, I guess it doesn't say standing. Uh, but he saw the sea of glass after he saw that vision of the people singing the song of us, by the way. That's us. John sees, John sees you singing. It's pretty incredible. So after this, I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen. This pure bright linen speaks of holiness. These angels are holy. Uh, with golden sashes around their chests. Now, in Revelation 1, we saw Christ with a golden sash around his chest. So these angels having that golden sash around their chest and Christ having the golden sash around their chest is connecting them. It's They are coming forward from him, that they're on the same team, if you will, all right? Which is important because what are these angels bringing? They're bringing bowls. What are the bowls filled with? Wrath. They're not. This is of the Lord. So the golden sashes that they're wearing, similar to the golden sash we saw Christ in Revelation 1. Verse 7. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Notice the bowls are full, which communicates the fierceness of this wrath. There is no hope for those people whom these bowls of wrath are poured on. Verse 8. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke, from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. So the next thing John sees here, after he saw a vision of the future redeemed people of God standing on the sea in heaven, is the heavenly counterpart of the tent of meeting in which God's holy presence dwelt during Israel's wilderness wandering after the Red Sea. Right? So they build these tents. Uh, eventually a temple will be built in Jerusalem where God's presence will dwell. Right? come out of wilderness, they come out of the Red Sea, they're in the wilderness, they build this tent, it's where God's presence was dwelt. 
And then eventually a temple in Jerusalem will be built, built where God's presence dwelt. Where does God's presence dwell now? Dwell now? In you. So now we're the tent, the temple, the tabernacle, right? So the tent here in this vision is the heavenly counterpart to these two earthly tents or temples or places where God's presence dwelt. It's important that we understand that because we then can figure out, well, why did, why was there a tent in the wilderness and why was there a temple? What was going on there? What was the purpose of these? And then we can see then what's happening in this vision a little bit more clearly. So the tent in Exodus, as well as the temple in Jerusalem, were again shadows of the ultimate tent of meeting. So why this vision, why does this vision in Revelation 15 have this and refer to this heavenly tent, heavenly um, uh, meeting place? So this vision, as well as the bulls themselves, are to encourage the persecuted believer during this age. How so? It's a reminder to the one suffering under persecution that all Pharaoh-like, Domitian-like, Nero-like, Hitler-like persecutors of God's people will in due time face the full wrath of God for their wickedness. Just like Pharaoh is guaranteed, 100%, full, complete, happening, inevitable. It's only a matter of time. It's not if, it's when at a certain point. And God also promises the persecuted believers that they will be upheld under persecution by his presence and will not falter under the weight of their persecutors. You have hope. A Christian that's about to be murdered under Nero's reign, you have hope. A Christian who's about to be murdered under communist um, Russia, you have hope. And the wrath of God will one day fall on the one who is persecuting you. It's certain and it's full. So what's up with this? Why is this image in, in, of the of the the tent of witness? In heaven, what's what's the purpose here? The vision concludes with verse eight. The sanctuary was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from His power, and no one can enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. So, no one can enter the sanctuary. Why, what does that mean? Why? Well, in Exodus forty, verse thirty-five. We see God's glory visibly falling on the tent of meeting in a cloud of smoke, which prevented Moses from being able to enter it. It's very similar to what we're just seeing here in this vision. It also happened later with Solomon in the temple at its dedication in 1 Kings 8, 10 through 11. So what's the point of somebody entering the tent of meeting? Why did Moses enter the tent of meeting? Why would somebody, why would the priest enter the Holy of Holies? What's going on in there? What was their role? What was the purpose of that? Because if nobody can come in, and we understand why they went in, and if that was removed, what's the point? Why are they not allowed to go in in this vision here? Remember, the tent in the wilderness and the temple in Jerusalem were places where God's presence dwelt. And mediators, like Moses, as well as the high priest in the temple, would go in and offer sacrifices on behalf of the people for their rebellion. So the tent and the temple were places of mediation between a holy God and sinful men. But here, this vision, it's intended to say that there is no more mediation. It's done. There is no, you, at a certain point, nobody could enter into the tent of meeting and be a mediator for Hitler. It was decided God gave him over, and then it's time for the full wrath of God to be poured out. At a certain point, same thing with Nero, Domitian, I mean, just no matter who it was. At a certain point, there is no more. God says, that's horrific. Think about that. There is no more hope. He's given over to a depraved mind. Think of Pharaoh. 
the same thing. At a certain point, there is no more mediation. And God's full, last wrath fell on Nero, Domitian, the Antichrist in the last day. Because it's all the same. It's how God interacts with, with this wicked world through the realm of judgment. So at a certain point, there was no mediation for Nero, Nero who burned Christians on poles in his garden. God gave him over to a divine wrath. Just like for those who lived on earth during the days of Noah, at a certain point, the door closed. And the ark, eventually, was not offered to anyone else. Done. Just like Pharaoh, after hardening his own heart time after time, he was given over, and the text even says God hardened his heart. There was cloud. No one can enter because it was time. There was no mediation left. There was no opportunity for repentance. It was bulls of full wrath, and which was last and finished for that particular scenario throughout time. Amen? So it, it's, it's a both and. It's an all thing. This is showing us what happens when God says, I'm done. So when you think about that, the horror that is, consider that that very thing happened to Christ on the cross because he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we could become the righteousness of God. And his full wrath fell on his son who was perfect sinless. It's terrifying. That should give us a good perspective, a good understanding of what we have been given and what we have been saved from. That the last, the finished, the bowl will not fall on us because it's already fallen on the one who died for us. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for my king. Uh, thank you for his faithfulness to you to take the bowl, the cup, your wrath for us. Uh, Lord, we pray that for those that you have written, those names that you have written in the book of life before the foundation of the world, um, that you have selected to save through the proclamation of your gospel in this building, I pray that they would come by the masses and that you would save more and more, all to the glory of Christ. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.